Okay, I thought maybe if I did a little video on Kepler's second and third law, it might help you with your homework, because we only got as far as the second one last Friday. So the second law says you have a planet orbiting the sun, which is centered at one of the two focal points. Here's the planet. If you draw a line from the sun to the planet, and then you stand over here with your stopwatch, and you time out a certain period of time, when the planet gets here, it will have swept out some area by that line. Then if you travel to the opposite side over here and you time out the same period of time, so T2, if it's the same period of time, then this area, A2, will be equal. So A1 will equal A2 as long as delta T1 equals delta T2. What that means, if you look at the structure, is that the planet must be traveling faster when it's closest to the sun and slower when it's further away. If you think about it in terms of conservation of energy, right, one half mv initial squared plus mgh initial equals, I'm leaving out the spring, one half mv final squared plus mgh final. It makes sense that the mgh is smaller here so the speed that one half mv squared has to be equal. Whereas over here, the h is bigger, the distance it is from the sun, so the speed would be smaller. Okay, the point when it's closest to the sun is called the perihelion. And the point that it's furthest from the sun is called the aphelion. And the way that you can remember it is a goes with a way. So it, when it's furthest away, it's at the aphelion. When it's closest, it's at the perihelion, okay? And if we were in class, I would say to you, when do you think these happen? And you would probably say it's closest in the summer and furthest away in the winter. Except remember that when it's our summer, it's somebody else's winter. So that doesn't work. And really, like this is not what causes seasons. What causes seasons is the earth, the tilt of the earth. If this is the sun, the earth is tilted right, either into or away from the sun. And it's, it's the tilt of the earth that's caused, whether we're tilted into, which is summer, or away from, which is winter, okay? And I'll come back to this uh, in class, okay, tomorrow to talk about the seasons because you can't graduate without knowing how, why the seasons are what they are. But back to this, this it then doesn't cause the seasons. Um, and you might think it, well, it should, but not really, because when we're closest to the sun, we're about 147.5 uh, million kilometers from it. And when we're furthest, we're 152.6 million. That's only a difference of 5.1 million. That's not a lot. Now, if you were to give me that in money, that would be a lot. But when you look at how far we are away, at either point, a difference of five million is not a big deal. It's like if you had 140, or if you had 152.6 million M&Ms in your room, and I went in and took 5.1 million, you'd hardly notice. And that's the same here. Okay, so this is not what causes the seasons. So when does the when are we at perihelion? We're actually at perihelion on January 3rd, and we're at we're at aphelion on July 4th. And when I taught in New York, I used to say to my American students, see, even the sun wants to get as far away from you as possible and on your national holiday. So just a way to help you remember it's July 4th, okay? And again, I'll come back to the seasons in class. So now let's look at Newton's third law, or it's not Newton's, Kepler's third law. And it's his third law that really gives us all the equations. His third law says the average radius of a planet's orbit R, P, cubed, okay, so radius of orbit, R, and then the P just stands for a planet. And this is radius of orbit, okay? And so the radius of orbit cubed over the period of revolution squared. Now, there are two words that you will see in this unit, revolution and rotation. Rotation is when you spin on your axis, and revolution is when you go around the sun.
Okay, the earth does both. It spins on its axis and it goes around the sun. So we're talking about period of revolution here, how long it takes the earth or another planet to go around the sun. This always will have to be in seconds and are in meters. So what Kepler found was this was equal to a constant. Now, that might not seem to be such a horrendously astounding thing, but what he realized was is he, if he took the data for Mars and he cubed the radius of Mars' um, orbit, and he divided it by the period of Mars' orbit squared. He got some number. Amazing, right? But then if he did the same thing for, like, Jupiter, over the period of Jupiter squared, what he found was he got the same number, and that's why it's amazing. And if we did it for the Earth, what he found was he got the same number again. Okay, so what he realized was as long as it was going around the same central body, so for all the planets this number would be the same, but if you do it for like the Earth's moon, r cubed over t of the moon squared, you get some number, but it will not be the same one as above because the central body is different. The central body here is the moon. But you could do, um, whoops, that should be an R. You could do R of the International Space Station cubed over T of the International Space Station squared, and you will get the same number as the moon. Okay, so as long as the central body is the same, anything revolving around it, will ha it's R cubed over T squared, will, uh, will be equal. So what we have then is the first version of Kepler's equation is r cubed of the planet, that's what the p stands for, over t squared of the planet. So the period of revolution cubed, oh, excuse me, the radius of revolution cubed over the period of revolution squared equals k, some constant that will be the same as long as the central body is the same. One of our equations, not that equal, however, not that um, useful. However, one that is more useful is if we take the data for one planet, it will be equal to the data for another one, or if it's two moons going around the same central body. Okay, so this one gets more use. So this is Kepler's third law. Thing was, he proved it with the data, but he didn't know why. It took Isaac Newton to, to f explain the why. Remember, Kepler was only a mathematician, okay? So he couldn't get the physics behind it, but Newton did. Because Newton said, wait, Fg is really just Fc. So G M1 M2 over R squared is equal to M V squared over R. One of the R's will cancel. This M is the buddy that's revolving around the other one, so it cancels. And so one of the equations you have on your sheet is V squared is equal to G M over R. And this M, I'm running out of space there, is the mass of the central body. And that's what CB stands for. Okay? And so this is handy whenever we want to know the speed that something's traveling. But then remember that V is also equal to 2 pi R over T. So if we take this and plug it into our V, so we had V squared is equal to G M over R. And we're going to plug it in here. So we get... 2 pi r over t squared is equal to gm, and remember this is the central body, over r. So 4 pi squared r squared over t squared. g mass of the central body over r. Bring your r up so it becomes r cubed. Take your 4 pi down. You have r cubed over t squared equals g mass of the central body over 4 pi squared. Look, this is Kepler's, what he had back on the other page. And look what's on this side. G is always a constant. The mass of the central body is always the same as long as everything's revolving around the same thing. 4 pi doesn't change. This is Kepler's constant that he couldn't figure out. So this equation, r cubed over t squared, is equal to g mass of the central body over 4 pi squared. Newton's version of Kepler's third law is the most useful and the one that you want to use probably in almost all the questions tonight. The other one might be this. Remember the t that needs to be in seconds. r is the radius of orbit. 
g is at 6.67 times 3 times 10 to the negative 11. Pi is pi, and CB is mass of the central body. Okay, so hopefully that'll help you with your homework questions.